Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have Jennifer Fugo with me. Uh, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So you are a nutritionist and I'm really excited to have you. We met several years ago in Baltimore um, at the Natural Foods, Natural, what is it? Natural Products natural, Expo. Yeah. Products Expo East. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I, uh, I wanted to have you on because for the month of April, we are focusing on healthy skin from the inside out. And that is your jam. Um, and it's something that I really haven't, um, like targeted and focused on. And a lot of this has to do with gut health and liver issues. And so many people are suffering from eczema and psoriasis and acne and so many issues. Um, and so I'd love to kind of just take a deep dive for those, you know, everyone knows someone or has themselves issues with skin problems. And uh, there are topical solutions that are marketed on TV and there are other ways to deal with it. So you have multiple um, courses and lots of resources. And I thought we would just do a great big dive into it because again, it's not something that I've ever focused on like specifically. Well, and hopefully we can talk about some of the very famous like toxic or inflammatory foods that people claim are really bad for skin conditions like eggs, butter, <laughs> um, different animal products um, that oftentimes are demonized and whether they're actually an issue or not. This is one of All my right. favorite conversations to have because I really, I don't know, there's something about like, everyone was like, don't, don't you want to go get certified, like being like, IFM. And I'm like, no, I really like to think for myself when it comes to what is and is not appropriate for, for people based on research and clinical experience. And it's not a knock at them, but I do think that they do a real disservice to chronic skin problems. And there's also an excessive amount of demonization of certain types of food and everything being labeled toxic, bad for you, inflammatory, and the rate of orthorexia within the sort of wellness world is alarming. It's staggering. And so I think we need to take a much more sensible approach to all of that. So that's what yeah. we're into it. Um, and I'll, uh, uh, just for the folks who are listening who don't know what IFM is, it's Institute for Functional Medicine. And I too, I mean, I've seen their kind of like out of the box, like diet plan that kind of covers a wide range of everything. It, it just, it's like, just, you know, make them eat this. And it's, it's also, I've, I've really struggled when I actually, um, many, many years ago was going to be a nutritionist for a functional medicine practitioner, uh, MD also who, uh, works, um, not far from me. And she wanted me following those protocols and it was a deal breaker for me. So, yeah. Um, so for anyone who, who, you know, you know, functional medicine is a great concept, but the nutrition recommendations coming from IFM are not always consistent with people who, um, are questioners and think for themselves. Yeah. We'll just put it that way. Yes. And the idea is that, oh, well, we'll take out the inflammatory foods to lower your inflammation and then everything else will be easier to correct or rebalance or fix or heal or whatever. And the reality is, and I work with people who have tried every diet, every elimination, some people are down to five foods at this point, and their skin is worse than it ever was. So how is elimination diet or, or dieting harder 
improving people's quality of life, their health outcomes, all of these things. And I think those are the people that are getting lost in the cracks because they don't fit the results that the diet is supposed to obtain. And so, you know, I started asking why. All right. Well, where shall we begin? Well, I think one of the the important things to definitely start with is rethinking that the fact that your gut impacts your skin, um, but it's not everything. Um, your your gut. So there's a lot of people online that'll talk about how, oh, your skin is a reflection of what's going on in your gut, and to some degree that's true. But there are a lot of other factors that go on that can impact chronic skin conditions. Um, And so there are plenty of people who do gut protocols and work on their gut and look at their stool tests and their microbiome and supplement with probiotics and prebiotics and all sorts of postbiotics now. Um, And they don't really get any better. And um, I think it's because it's too narrow of a focus and it's not, I mean, if we're really truly going to look at root causes of what's driving one individual um, and their particular mm, inflammatory process, then we actually have to be serious about that and ask what's going on under the surface when you've tried all the topical things, you've tried all the diets, you've tried all of the supplements even that you can think of or you feel comfortable trying, then what is going on? Um, And so one of the things I realized very early on is that while yes, there is a direct link from your skin to your gut through the gut-skin axis, There are too many other connections that are impacted by it that aren't in the GI tract or that are sort of take the brunt of what's going on in the GI tract in terms of dysbiosis and whatnot. And so I look at actually 16 different root causes. And what I found and what explains why what might work for you, right, but won't work for me and somebody else will get even worse is that if one's root causes are different than the next, it makes sense why there's not one cookie cutter solution. That's why one diet doesn't work for everyone. Um, And so looking at things like phase two liver detoxification, which is highly nutrient driven, most of those um, pathways actually require very specific nutrition in order to run or else they really slow down. It's not about doing a detox or some sort of cleanse. It's about nourishing those pathways so that they have, I liken it to, um, you know, and I love Lucy, maybe I'm dating myself that I used to watch this as a kid, but in I love Lucy, do you remember that scene where Lucy and Ethel go to the chocolate factory oh, yeah. and they have to wrap the, the bonbons? And so I sort of describe phase two liver detox like that scene where your body has to wrap or transform these particular things, and we'll just call them toxic, because a lot of times what comes out of phase one becomes more toxic, then has to pass through phase two to be made water soluble, and then we're able to excrete it. But if you don't have the wrappers available, like aka the nutrients available, you can't do that efficiently. And so this sort of, I call it a waiting room between phase one and phase two backs up, and we start to then Um, put too much pressure on the system, the liver starts to get bogged down because it can't efficiently get these toxins out of the system. And so the fix is not to like run out and do this like whole detox cleanse with fasting and juicing and all of this stuff. It's really about saying what nutrients do those pathways require so that they can wrap the (laughs) the toxic bonbons to help get them out of the system. And what's really fascinating is that when my associate and I started to employ this approach to this really super nutrient dense um, replenishment, not just focusing on um, liver detoxification pathways, but also other nutrients, especially when it comes to psoriasis, like we have some photos and I even was like, wait, did this person make sure to put the right date on these? Because like, There are some photos that are less than two weeks apart of looking at someone's angry red plaques that now look light pink. And I even was like, wait, right? Because like, you're like, how did that happen in that short of a period of time? They didn't start using steroid creams. They didn't start, they literally just replenished the nutrients that their body was struggling because it needed it so badly. And now all of a sudden it can wrap those bonbons and get them out of the system, which is really, really cool. I'm now, now I'm hungry for some bonbons. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, But it's, it's one of those things where 
when we look at this, the problems in front of us, we can find creative solutions. And um, the way that the gut plays into liver detox is that not only is there obviously a direct line of, of sometimes we're, we're seeing toxic byproducts from gut flora, like specifically benzoates actually heading to phase two liver detox. But um, it's just so cool to see how all these different systems, so we've got the liver, we've got mitochondria, so the body's ability to make energy, appropriate thyroid function, um, looking at adrenal health as well, because if you've been taking or using steroids for a long period of time, some people, their body actually becomes addicted to topical steroids and even to like prednisone and whatnot, and it suppresses uh, cortisol production because cortisone is man-made cortisol. And so because of the feedback loop in the HPA axis, when we keep taking in or applying cortisol topically, that's essentially what it is, your body's like, oh, I don't need to do this. And it becomes addicted to those exterior sources. So looking at all these different factors as well as um, dysbiosis on the skin, because we have a microbiome there, uh, looking at histamine issues, all sorts of stuff. And, and diet is just one piece. That's the big piece of the, all of this. So I hope it's a little helpful to, to just realize that when, when, um, when people say they've done it all for their skin, a lot of times because they're not taking a broader approach to figure out what exactly is going on, um, they can end up really struggling for a long time. So, um, so where does someone start? Let's say, I mean, do you, do you start with the specific skin condition or do you start with uh, just assessing the person's overall, you know, like I, I know you have a self-guided course that people can take. Um, how does one get started in all this? So the first thing is, yes, to take into account what diagnosis you've gotten. Sometimes it's unclear because there are instances where, for example, psoriasis can look like eczema. Um, and they will do usually do a biopsy to try to determine what's going on. Um, so misdiagnosis is possible, but I wouldn't fixate so heavily on what particular exact skin condition that you have because like to make it even more narrowed, like what happens if you have numular eczema or dyshydroidic eczema or gutty psoriasis is that different from plaque psoriasis like we could go down rabbit holes that sometimes are actually not all that helpful there are sometimes there's like nuance to it like gutty psoriasis is associated with a higher risk of um, the trigger being uh, strep pyrogenes um, so a lot of people who had psoriasis show up, especially as a kid or even adult onset, will notice that it was triggered after they had strep throat. So there's a lot of really cool, I mean, it's not cool for that person, but it is cool it's research that shows these different connections of possible triggers. Um, so yes, it, it's, it's one of the facets, but then I would say looking at the different bodily systems. So looking at your gut function, how often do you have bowel movements? Um, are you having digestive distress? Are you, you know, what other, what other symptoms do you have throughout your entire body that can help guide us toward those unique root causes, right? What if, for example, you have a psoriasis diagnosis? So I had a client who had psoriasis on her hands. And when she finally got to me, she had tried every diet. She was extremely exhausted, um, very depressed, um, and she was in a lot of pain. And so as I went through and talked to her, all of her boxes were checking off that there was clearly some possible, some type of thyroid issue and testing confirmed because her TSH was 33, which is the highest I've ever seen in my practice. Because um, for those listening, if you don't know, you, should, you ideally should not be above 4.5 to 5 on the, in the conventional model. One to two is generally considered more optimal. So she was like really hypothyroid. And not that it's like we ideally want to see people end up on medication, but there can be a time and place for it. And for her, getting on some thyroid medication made this huge shift because her energy improved, her mood was like turning the light bulb on, her, she wasn't in so much pain, her psoriasis lessened, 
So that way we could start doing all of that other work under the surface that was driving it in the first place. So that's why it's important to say, all right, what exactly are, is my diagnosis? But then what are all these other pieces, even if they're unconnected to the skin, who cares? Your body is one connected unit. And that can help tell us what our um, unique root cause combo is. So out of 16 possible issues, usually people have three to six. Um, and I would say that most people have the liver detox, that phase two liver detox overload. That's one of the most common issues that I see. And a simple recommendation can be something like simply adding glycine, which is an amino acid, to help fuel at least the glycine pathway. It's one of the pathways in phase two detox. And for some people, it makes a huge improvement um, in a matter of like two to three weeks. Great. And so, um, yeah, again, just wondering like for that, for that person that's listening and they want to kind of take immediate action right now, they, um, maybe they're, you know, they, they're gluten-free, dairy-free, um, you know, they've eliminated sugar, they're taking their probiotics. How might they know, um, you, do you want to like walk through maybe the, the different, 16 issues that you've identified? Yeah. And I mean, I can also, we can also um, share a graphic in the show notes too. Okay. So that way we're not like rattling off a lot of things. But I mm-hmm. do think that um, the one piece in terms of diet, because that's usually what people have most of the questions around because they're very fed up. It's either you've eliminated so many things and you can no longer enjoy food with family, going to events, and you also just don't know what to eat because you're so overwhelmed by I have seen people on Facebook groups say, so am I just supposed to eat air? Like they don't know what, literally what to eat anymore because everything has become demonized depending on who you look, whether you go to like the carnivore side, which says that plants are bad for you, or you go to the fully plant-based and vegan side, which they're like, oh, everything that's from an animal is inflammatory and you shouldn't have that. Um, and so it gets to a point where you just don't know what to do. And a lot of the diet books also push people toward being more plant-based, which I love plants. I have, I want to be very clear in all of my comments so that nobody mistakes me. I eat meat. <laughs> I am um, an omnivore and I also have raised bed gardens. I have fruit trees in my backyard. Like I am a big believer in that we should all to some degree be a little self-sufficient. If I could have chickens, I would. Like I, I would do different things, but there, there are laws in my town, so prohibits the chickens. But yeah, I so, think we're on the same page. Like my, my yeah. opinion, you know, because a lot of people think that I promote carnivore just because I'm so pro meat, and I promote meat because it's so demonized. But my goal for everybody is to eat as many foods that don't give them problems or stimulate overeating as possible. A hundred percent, I agree with you. A hundred percent, and I think that's a very refreshing message in the chronic skin problem world because I want, my goal for every single client is to eat the most diverse diet that works for them. And at the end of the day, I know they're like, what does that mean? Does that mean I should go to eat at McDonald's? I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. But like, listen, if you want to go to a stop and do something, like just have it, enjoy it and like move on with your day. But like that should not be the norm. Um, Because I just, I worry when I have worked with so many people that are afraid to eat, they're under eating protein, they are under eating calorically, especially women who like think that if they just keep cutting, they're going to get healthier, when in reality, their body is stuck in starvation mode, because they're just not consuming enough calories, it's not good for your thyroid, not good for all the nutrients that you need, right, for all of these pathways and the nutrient wells that have become incredibly dry. Um, but also there are some foods that they do not react to, and yet they're constantly being told that they're bad for you. And so my thing is, look, if there's, if there's one food, and I always get asked this, is there one food that you would recommend to avoid when you're dealing with skin issues? Generally speaking, I would say gluten, but not like gluten's the devil, gluten's the worst thing in the world. A lot. I want to try to keep what's going on in the gut, inside the gut. And gut, there is an ample amount of research from celiac, like um, the celiac pioneer, Dr. Alessio Fasano, that shows that every single person has an increase in gut permeability when exposed to gluten. It's just about their tolerance. I'd like to try and keep the chaos within the GI tract, like somewhat contained. 
Um, but at the end of working with me privately, if as long as somebody doesn't have celiac disease or an allergy to wheat or some other factor that's a problem, like if they want to try to reintroduce sourdough bread or older versions of wheat, have at it. And like, if you, if it works for you, awesome. I'm happy for you. And so my, one of my goals is to always say like, do an assessment. And especially if you took foods out that you heard or read were inflammatory. And I'm talking about whole foods, right? Not like processed sugars and candy that you buy at the grocery store. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like beef, eggs, dairy, et cetera. Like, or um, strawberries, spinach, like any number of things that people go down these rabbit holes of like, well, that's high oxalate. That's bad for you. Oh, that's high salicylate. That's bad for you. Like, I mean, we could, at a certain point, your body has mechanisms in place that allow it to flourish on these foods. Now, granted, the landscape may have shifted over time and you now need more support or you need to do a little work to get back there. But at the end of the day, most people can reintroduce foods that they took out. There, I have plenty of eczema clients who eat eggs just fine. I have psoriasis clients who eat grass-fed, pasture-raised beef just fine without an issue. And so that's why I would just caution every single person from assuming that the entire reason why their system is out of whack is because of some sort of rhetoric, like inflammatory fear-based rhetoric around the nourishment that we ultimately need. And also sometimes when we have reactions, because we put the food in our mouth, we assume that what happens afterwards is a result of that food. But what if it's not actually the food's fault? It's the result of what happens once it gets down into the gut microbiome and due to gut imbalances with digestion and absorption and the microbiome, that's the react, that's the problem. It's not the food itself to blame. And it's difficult for us to suss that out. And so I just, I, it makes me really sad when nourishment is seen as the enemy. So, um, so yeah, that's been one of my big things. And I've also had the pleasure and um, to to collaborate with a dermatologist at UC Davis. And we actually did a, a survey-based study for people who have chronic skin conditions. And we had over 600 people complete the survey. And what we found was not only that the, the younger you are, the more prone you are with the use of elimination diets to develop fear of food and negative association with food. It was something like 18 to 24 year olds, I wanna say it was something like 74% now had fear of food as a result of an elimination diet use. But also what, what was interesting was we looked at people who had, no, had either a history of eating disorders or none at all. And even f about 50% of those who had no prior history of an eating disorder also developed a fear of food. So at that point, we have to ask ourselves, is the elimination diet route the best way, the most responsible way to actually support a body that needs a variety of nutrients, a variety, especially fat-soluble vitamins, um, and all sorts of fiber and all sorts of things that help nourish all of our systems as a whole. And so, um, yeah, so I, I just take a very different approach, I guess, than some of my colleagues. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, phase two um, detox and kind of explained that really nicely. And you you briefly mentioned adrenal function with cortisol. Um, what are some of the other um, pathways that could be awry during, you know, uh, you know, people who struggle with skin issues? Yeah. So one of the interesting pathways that I definitely like to talk about is what I call histamine overload because histamine intolerance is like exploded. Um, over the past, I mean, not that it's exploded, but I actually don't believe that there's as much histamine intolerance as people say there is. I actually think it's histamine overload. And the difference, I, I know it's nitpicky, but I do think it's significant because words matter. Intolerance is very specific. It means that your body does not produce an enzyme that will appropriately break something down, right? We, if you're lactose intolerant, you don't have an, a sufficient amount of lactase in the body. Fine. But is it really that we're not producing enough enzymes to break down 
histamine. Really? I have plenty of clients that have tried DAO or diamine oxidase supplementation because that's the primary uh, enzyme in the GI tract that breaks down uh, histamines. They see no improvement at all. It's not a DAO problem. It, so we have two different enzymes. Uh, HMNT is the intracellular um, enzyme that breaks down uh, um, histamine. And it's also through the methyl methylation, which is associated with, again, phase two detox. And so um, what I, my feeling, and I have other colleagues that agree with me, is that actually histamine intolerance for most people is actually histamine overload, where the body itself is generating so much histamine that the amount of enzymes that you have available to you cannot deal with the load. And it, it forgets the fact that not only can there be histamine release because of certain organisms like H. pylori, which in most skin conditions is somewhere between 60 to, I would almost say 75% of cases show that they are H. pylori positive. And that's on research, not what I see in my practice. Um, but also there are organisms that directly produce histamine like Morganella, which can, I mean, a histamine infection in a fish can kill it, uh, or a Morganella infection in fish can kill it because of the production, the like huge production of histamine. Um, also, uh, there are certain Klebsiella species, not Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is most connected oftentimes in functional medicine to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But other Klebsiella species can actually produce histamine as well. And there are other organisms, there's a whole list of them that either produce histamine or trigger the release of histamine. And then there's also parasites, mold, exposure fungus, et cetera. And so if you just have too much of that, you're swimming in it. You can't walk away from it. You can't shut the door and go to bed. It's going to bed with you. And so um, I think that's one of the facets of, of how to rethink the way that we look at things so that we can actually get to um, a, a better resolution. And um, yeah, so that's another piece to it as well. Um, that's one but, of my, one of my favorite ones too, for people who are struggling with, uh, urticaria, chronic hives or dermatographia, that's, that's a, usually a big piece of their puzzle. Um, will you explain histamines just for the folks that, um, that are maybe have heard, oh, histamines or, you know, have, uh, you know, cause the low histamine diet, I have counseled people who have asked me to help them with a low histamine diet. And okay. that is so difficult to follow, um, especially for someone like me who cooks a ton of leftovers. I mean, you can't eat a leftover. So will you explain exactly what a histamine is? Yeah. So histamines are, um, they are a really important, I would almost argue like a neurotransmitter that helps keep us alert and awake. <laughs> and so there are times where histamine is, and, and it is important. It's not bad. I think we get carried away with everything has to be good or bad. Like it's important, just too much. It's the Goldilocks thing, right? Too much is not good. And so there are times when your body can, so we have things called mast cells that are like little Amazon warehouses that float around the body. And when they become destabilized because they contain histamine, they basically dump it. And so you get this huge release of histamine into the system that can cause you to have hives, get itchy, um, in severe, really severe instances, anaphylaxis, um, you know, if you're exposed to an allergen. Um, you know, in my world, it's mostly chronic hives. Um, I don't, I don't work with a lot of clients um, who have really, really like mast cell activation syndrome is beyond my scope of practice. I don't work with individuals who are in that end, but hives, dermatographia, dermatographia is where you could like draw a picture on your skin with your nail and it'll just welt up. And like, you could literally write your name on your skin and mm -hmm. it'll show up as a welt. Um, and so histamine has to be broken down. And so the enzymes break it down so that it essentially gets deactivated. But there are certain factors that can drive it higher. Obviously, producing too much of it internally is a factor. Um, it is, it also can, so estrogen, unfortunately, makes our cells more sensitive to histamine. So that's where pooping appropriately uh, one to three times a day, healthy bowel movement is really important. So that's actually part of phase three detox where we are eliminating toxins and whatnot. Um, but if there also are organisms within the GI tract, typically gram negative bacteria that have the beta glucuronidase enzyme, they, that actually re 
like it turns estrogen that's been deactivated by your liver back on so that it gets reabsorbed. And so you can't get estrogen efficiently out of your body. And unfortunately, that state makes you more sensitive to histamine, more itchy. Um, some people, some women specifically, I do think there was a one case study I saw of a man, but some women can actually develop an allergy to their progesterone. Their own progesterone. Yeah. It's pretty horrifying, right, to think that you develop an allergy to your own hormone that your body makes. Um, and that, so usually for most women, I'll, I'll ask them to track their flare cycles. And usually you can see a correlation of an increase when progesterone spikes. Um, and you can also, I have actually a whole episode on that on, on the Healthy Skin Show podcast. Um, because that that's pretty serious. There's not a ton of great options at this point in time because it's considered such a rare situation. But I think it's actually more like it's undiagnosed because nobody's looking for it. Um, but that's another instance. And obviously having allergies to things that you don't know you have allergies to. And developing, we can actually develop allergies just kind of going back to food. If you eliminate foods and you really don't need to, you can develop an actual IgE reaction to those foods when you try to reintroduce. Uh, this happened to an eczema client of mine last fall. She had eliminated eggs because she heard they were bad for her. And so when we started working together, we went through the list of foods that she wanted to reintroduce. And when we got to eggs, her face blew up, her mouth blew up, she was having trouble breathing, her eyes got all swollen, and she was super itchy. And I, incur I told her, you need to go to an allergist. This sounds like an allergy, not just like a you sensitivity. Know, sensitivity right? right. And um, it turned out she needs an EpiPen now because she has an egg allergy. Mm. And we are starting to see more of this, unfortunately. So, you know, be very cautious. I'm not trying to tell anyone that you need to be afraid to play with your diet, but I think that there should be clearer guidelines for someone who doesn't have like the training that you and I have and the experience that you and I have, you know, if you start eliminating things and you really aren't seeing an improvement after like four to six weeks, I would almost argue you might want to check in with somebody else to see what's going on. The, the, the day, it's a really slippery slope to go, oh, well, I'm going to take this out. I'm going to take that out. Oh, I read about this new diet. I'm just going to take all those things out. And slowly you end up on this like really tiny island where you're not getting enough nutrition, not getting enough calories. Your nutrient density has plummeted. And now you're reacting to everything and you don't know what to eat. That's a really dangerous place to be in. And it is happening very frequently in our community because people are overlaying these different um, functional diet books and their protocols, and they end up on such a, oh my, and trying to get someone who is legitimately afraid now to reintroduce foods is a whole process. So the low histamine diet, I will be honest, I hate it, but sometimes it is necessary, unfortunately, um, for a period of time. But the goal should always be to try to get histamine addressed as quickly as possible. Um, so one, a couple of tips on that. Obviously things like quercetin can be helpful, zinc, vitamin C, those kind of things. But another thing to try is immunoglobulins. So oral immunoglobulins. Hmm. And one of the reasons why is that I had tried this. I just had an idea and I tried it with a client and then I had a whole conversation um, with Karan Krishnan on my podcast from Microbiome Labs. And so the reason that it can be helpful is that not only can it bind to different things in the GI tract that are causing issues, but it also helps drive down the IgE reaction. So the body, when it's really struggling to deal with what's happening in the GI tract, it, if IgA plummets, IgE will rise. And so by adding in more supplemental immunoglobulins, it actually helps drop that IgE level. And so you do have to take higher doses than what are on the bottle, but it has been a game changer because then I have clients who are able to start reintroducing foods, high histamine foods. And for them, they're like, okay, now I'm more comfortable. I'm eating more food. I can start to do all this other work in the meantime. Um, but 
yeah, it's um, histamine. The diet is, that's a really hard diet. And the things that, you know, obviously like, okay, you know, vinegar, wine, beer, like those are the obvious things, yogurt. But then there's things that you wouldn't expect like avocado and certain types of fish. And it's, there's like no rhyme or reason to it because some foods release histamine. Some, um, some foods have higher histamine con- contents, like you said, because they're, they've sat out after cooking because all food increases in histamine content as from that point where it stops cooking. Um, But it is a really tricky diet. And just to be very clear, not all eczema itch is driven by histamine. And so that sometimes is very freeing for people who've been on antihistamines for a long time and who have eczema and it's not helping them because it's not all driven by histamine, believe it or not. And I actually had a dermatologist that works at Johns Hopkins University on my show who's done research on this. And um, he actually said, and he's a very conventional minded guy, he's like, look, we've got the vagus nerve. It connects what's going on in the GI tract to the brain. And sometimes your brain misreads signals of distress and irritation and inflammation as itch when it's not actually itch. So it could be a skin infection, but if it's not, it is possible. That should be another sign to you of the value of at least looking at what's going on in the GI tract um, and as well as the liver detox system and all the other things that we've talked about today. <laughs> yeah, you, you're covering a ton. Yeah, it's interesting. My daughter, um, when she was younger, she developed a rash around her mouth and she had just been eating a ton of strawberries um, and you know, like, like literally laying in the strawberry patch, eating all these strawberries. I'm like, well, I don't really know if you're allergic to strawberries because that's, you've had strawberries before and you're, I don't know, it's just not making sense. And, um, it turned out that strawberry season coincides with, um, when all the, uh, trees bloom here. Yes. And so she just has to lay off strawberries when they're actually in season, um, just because there is like a histamine kind of overload just in the environment. Yeah. So Um, it's cross-reactive allergy syndrome. Yeah. Oral allergies. Yeah. Right. So her, her like bucket of stress was just a little bit overwhelmed just with all the pollen and everything else that was going on. Um, so she's fine with strawberries any other time than when they're actually in season. (laughs) (laughs) She violates the tenant of like, Eat, eat what's in season. Yeah. <laughs> she legit. See, this is why, again, there's rules, but they're more guidelines. Yeah. You, gotta, you, you do you at the end of the day. Yeah. Because, like, I would hate to deprive somebody of, like, no strawberries forever if they couldn't, like, it's all yeah. right, they're out of season, but enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where? What do you, uh, any specifics? So, you know, t- thinking about my daughter, because um, I don't have, I, I've never really had to struggle with much skin issues. I've had gut issues, not skin problems. Um, but even, and even when I was a teenager, I didn't really struggle with acne, but, um, but, and I have two kids, one did not, one does. Um, where do you start with teenage acne? Ooh, well, I can tell you first off, I don't really work with teenagers. Uh, Okay. So I'm not the best person to ask about that. Um, I have some colleagues that do work with, with acne. Um, but I will say that part of the problem is it's just such a huge hormone fluctuation. Obviously, yeah. like the processed sugars and the processed, all the processed stuff is a problem. Um, but I would also, you know, the other thing to kind of tease out of what's going on is, is it possible that it's also like a f- possible fungal issue? Because you can have fungal acne as mm. well. Um so yeah, acne is not really my wheelhouse. That's definitely okay. not a, a skin topic that I focus on a lot. I usually send like those call those clients to like Robin Johnson and she's got like a whole thing um, for acne, which is great for people. But That's- it is tricky with te- t- with teens, unfortunately. I would I would still I don't know if I would go out and buy like a Dutch test and spend that level. I mean, that's like hundreds of dollars. I don't know that I would do that, but I would probably definitely look at their diet, liver detox. So again, not doing a liver detox, but looking at the nutrients required for phase two detox and then looking at their GI tract and considering could there be something going on there that could be supportive, right? Because we know that when they use Accutane, 
it's i mean a you're not supposed to get pregnant when you're using that but also it has a huge impact on the microbiome yeah you know and traditionally they use te- i mean i when i was a kid i had acne and they used tetracycline which you know you're got to be careful with but they use antibiotics and as much as we can say it's for inflammatory purposes i mean they still do impact the gut microbiome, even like low-dose doxycycline, which is oftentimes given for um, chronic staph infections on the skin. So Mm. I just think we have to, we have to dig a little bit deeper and be open to that rather than trying to find a Band-Aid for one thing. And it may be too that they need to change their skincare routine as well because their skin is reacting to these huge fluctuations in hormones. Yeah. um, Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I do think that it's just some people just have surges in hormones and, and it just kind of is something that goes along with being a teenager probably. Um, so, uh, do you want to like spitfire, you know, before we go like a few of your favorite nutrients that, um, that you recommend to folks who are struggling? Um, yeah. Um, so I would say I love, well, I don't know if it's considered a nutrient, but um, butyrate is really yeah. important. It's produced by uh, gut flora when they're exposed to short, um, to exposed to prebiotics and FODMAPs and that kind of thing. So FODMAPs aren't bad for you if you can tolerate yeah. them; they're great. And it it's actually found in ghee as well as pistachios. So I'm not saying you should like eat those all day, but. Those are, I always love to suggest those, assuming that you don't have an allergy to nuts or pistachios or cow's milk. But I do think there's ghee. You can get ghee from other animals as well if you look hard enough. Um, I also would say, like, most people, at least with chronic skin problems, don't eat enough protein. That has been my experience from, like, I have a group. So the the one program you were talking about, the Skin Rash Rebuild, um, we have people track their protein intake in the the beginning and the majority of people are like, Oh my gosh, I was so below what you're suggesting. Like I'm nowhere near this. I thought that protein was bad because like I have muscles and I just can tap into that and you really should not. So drastically improving protein intake really helps, but also glycine. So this is the deal with glycine. Yes. Collagen is rich in glycine, but you can, so the, the suggestion of glycine that I give is usually three to five grams, which equals 3,000 to 5,000 milligrams. Um, That's on top of whatever you take in in your diet. So you cannot use collagen or go by what's on your protein powder or whatever as like, oh, no, 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 I'm getting like 10,000 you know, milligrams a day of glycine. I'm like, no, 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 no. Your well is dry. You need supplemental glycine. So usually we split those doses like one to two times a day. Um, and then, uh, vitamin B6 can be really helpful, especially for liver enzymes. Um, you can overdo, uh, vitamin B6. So uh, the general recommendation I feel comfortable giving is like somewhere between like 10 to 15 milligrams, but make sure to look at like your multivitamin and other things that you take that are, that have supplements in them. Cause sometimes it's in there. If not, you can look for a, a B6 or P5P supplement, Um, they're not usually in smaller doses, but if you, maybe like you find a 30 milligram or 50 milligram, maybe you do it like twice a week and it evens out. (laughs) So those are some really easy suggestions. I would also say I love zinc, but I do think people overdo it and they don't do it in combination with copper. So if you love zinc rich foods, like oysters, awesome. If you can't do shellfish or you just don't like it like me, um, I would try to find something that has a good balance of copper and zinc. Usually it's 15 milligrams to every one milligram of copper. So try to find something so they're balanced and it balances that ratio. And then I would also argue that before you supplement things, like I love vitamin D, I love vitamin A, I love the fat soluble nutrients, but get your levels checked first before you go supplementing. And a little tidbit, I don't know if you've kind of saw this as well, but usually when someone has low or insufficient vitamin D, they're usually low in vitamin A because they're not eating the foods that are rich in vitamin D. So I'm like, okay, we'll just assume you need vitamin A as well. So like liver is great if you can eat it. Awesome. If you can swallow those liver pills. Awesome. I can't do either of those things. (laughs) So for me, it is a supplement, but like find what works for you. That was one reason why too, like I'm not 
is anti-dairy. Um, if you can tolerate dairy, like butter especially is a great source for vitamin D and vitamin A. So again, it's about what you can tolerate, what you can do, and slowly building a diet as your body and that the inflammation starts to shift, building a diet that you enjoy, that you actually enjoy eating, you love food. Um, but by finding, like I was saying, just it's important to find those, your little unique combo of root causes. And I have that one worksheet. I know we're going to throw that into the show notes. Um, that's really easy for people to go through the whole process I go through with my clients to help you figure out what those root causes are for you. And then you can really hone in. Um, and I, and again, I have the, that skin rash rebuild program, which is awesome. It's eight weeks. It's like, people are like, it's like a fire hose of so much information. I never learned any of this in the last 10 years of going to the doctors. I'm like, well, you know, it's, I've been in this unique position because I had eczema and I had hydrogenitis supportiva that I'm able to be, to share all of that. I mean, I have almost 300 episodes of the healthy skin show. So it boils down all of that. And what I see clinically in new research, um, to help everyone on their own unique journey. Um, and so if you're looking for any particular topics, I probably have it covered and then some on the show. Um, but yeah, it, it I, this, the, I love nerding out about this stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. And yeah, and I can mention too, I um, just on the dairy end of things, I um, when I was undiagnosed celiac, I could not do any dairy at all. Um, and now that my gut is, you know, I've been uh, gluten-free for so long, um, I still can't really drink milk. I don't even like the idea of drinking milk because I never drank milk as a kid and it just seems weird. Um, and I don't... I don't think it's particularly necessary for my diet, but I do great with cheese and butter and yogurt. And so for those of you out there who think you can't do dairy, um, you know, you might be able to tolerate the fermented dairy. And I do it because of the great, um, you know, vitamin K2, vitamin A, like all, all those other great things, especially in the grass fed dairy. Yeah. And especially like the, it makes everything richer. It tastes more rich, mm -hmm. right? Like when we eat food that just has so, such amazing flavor, as opposed to bland foods, we feel satisfied, you know, yeah. flavor is just as important as the nutrients that are in it. So, Yeah. Awesome. Um, so great. So we're going to put the link to, um, your course in the show notes and, um, where can people find you if they want to learn more? How can they find you on social media and your website, everything else? Yeah. So my website's called Skin Interrupt. Um, I'm not going to spell that for you. So the easy way to get there is healthyskinshow.com. <laughs> and uh, you'll be able to also find all of the podcast episodes. Like I said, there's almost 300. We have everything fully transcribed as well if you prefer to read. Um, and then I'm over on Instagram and most social media platforms just at Jennifer Fugo. Um, F U G O. So that, yes. So that's the easy way to find me. And I love to, I mostly hang out on Instagram though. I am with you on that. Instagram is my thing. Uh, really do dislike Twitter immensely and, um, Facebook just, mm. I'm actually never on my, um, professional Facebook. I, I sometimes am on my personal one, but Agreed. Uh, and that's Agreed. usually just for professional stuff too. It's kind of funny, but yeah. Um, well, it was so great to catch up. And I know um, you, it, this all started with you inviting me on your podcast, yes. which um, which I, I promise I will get around to as soon as I have a minute. Um, but I really appreciate your time uh, here on ours. And um, it's something that I've never really covered before. And I love having dietitians that have their own specialty that um, I just have never really dug into. So I, I really appreciate your expertise in this. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Have a great day. Thanks so much for listening today and for following my work. If you believe in making sure people all over the world should have access to nutritious food, please join my mission through my nonprofit, the Global Food Justice Alliance. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash join and become a sustaining member today. All sustaining members get early access to ad-free podcasts plus free downloads and you'll be helping get healthy protein like meat, fish, and eggs to food insecure kids. That's sustainabledish.com backslash join. And thank you.